So let me just give you a very quick bit of background uh, and also instructions for how to listen to my talks. Not everything important in the world has a convincing visual representation. <laughs> so when I'm talking about something that doesn't have any real visual representation, I put a nice picture of a flower on the screen. Um, so just that's, that's your sign that like, you know, things are still happening, but they don't have uh, photons bouncing off them. Um, so Derek already went through this. I, I wrote a book. It's uh, all available under a free open source license at producingoss.com. Producing open source software is the title. Uh, there's a second edition uh, that I completed recently and a, a conference called Hack Illinois. Did anyone here go to Hack Illinois? There, yay, hey, oh, hey there. Um, they actually did a print run, an early print run of the second edition, so I have one of those copies here. Uh, I guess I'll you know, do that thing where I give it out for best question or something at the end. Um, so you can all dive for it at, when we get to the Q&A. Um, uh, so let's, let's set some definitions. Uh, open source software, in case anyone is under any misconceptions about what it is. Um, oh, I, hey, I can see my own slides by standing here. That's, that's great. <laughs> and I don't have to keep turning around. Um, here's a definition. It's software that anyone can modify and uh, share with anyone with no restrictions on how you can change the code or with what you do with the code uh, or with whom you share it. Uh, that definition, you'd be surprised how often people uh, don't get all aspects of that definition. There are a lot of companies that put out code um, and they say, well, okay, yeah, you can use this for anything you want, but you can't charge money for the software. You, you, you can't do anything that's commercial. I just want to make it very clear that this is not just for me, like everybody who deals with open source software on a regular basis, every lawyer, every company, this includes Microsoft, it includes the Wikimedia Foundation, it includes the Open Source Initiative, the Free Software, they all agree on all of the points I'm about to tell you, in case anyone argues with you that that is not the case, which believe me, happens a lot. Um, there's no such thing as non-commercial use only open source software. There's no such thing as government only or academic only. Anybody can use any piece of open source software for any purpose. Um, and also, by the way, some of you are probably familiar with copyleft licenses, like the GNU GPL, that say if you, know, if you get software under this license, then you must be able to get the source code, and you can always redistribute it under that license, uh, including derivative works. And then other, like, straight up what are called um, non-copyleft or permissive so-called licenses, like BSD, MIT, Apache. Um, I realize this is jargon for some of you, but for those of you who know, both kinds, copyleft and non-copyleft license, are both open source software licenses and they are both free software licenses. It is not the case that copyleft is, uh, is free software and the other kind is open source. That is not true, do not think that. Okay, I'm sorry to have to bust so many myths right at the beginning, this talk is about more interesting things, but there has been a lot of terminological confusion in the open source world. Um, in fact, the thing that we now call open source software and that previously we called and sometimes still call free software used to be called software. Um, <laughs> now we call it free software or sometimes open source. Some people have decided to call it Libra software and you'll run into folks who think that that means uh, like it's an astrological sign, like Libra software. So that, I mean, it's a great word, but it's not really an English word. We don't, we don't do phonetics like that. So, you know, you can try it, but uh, anyway, when people use that, it means the same thing. It gets abbreviated free and open source software, free Libra open source software, you get the idea. But as I said, in the beginning, it was all called software, and this is what computers look like. And the reason that all software was pretty much shared was because the main expense was the computer itself. If you had a computer, you had like a big room with its own cooling system and special like, you know, those plugs that washers and dryers go into that are shaped differently from normal electrical sockets. You had a lot of those in that room. You had a staff to maintain the computer and you had a relationship with the manufacturer and they would supply you parts. And the software that ran on the computer, they just gave you that for free because the expense was that you were buying this iron, you know, these physical objects. Um, and then if there were, say, three universities that bought a very similar model of computer, you would all get in touch with each other and there wasn't really an internet for the most part to spread stuff around on, but you would share your software patches. Like if you, you found a bug in the operating system, the manufacturer would thank you and they would take the patch from you and they would share it or maybe you share it directly with this other university. This was actually the norm for most software development. Um, and what happened to change this was standardization. This looks more recognizably like a computer, but the really important way to think of it is this. Uh, it is a set of standardized parts that interact in a standardized way and that means that the hardware can be manufactured very cheaply and you can write one piece of software that runs on all the computers. 
um, and various other technological developments have happened to make software run on all the computers. Um, so now we're going to change the subject. You all remember this guy, right? I saw, I saw a sigh throughout the room. That's interesting. Um, but what you may not remember is this fellow. Uh, he served as president in the Cheney administration. I'm sure some of you remember his name. He had, uh, he had a very interesting uh, philosophy that he talked about a lot until September 11th, 2001, after which he talked about other things. But before he knew that was going to happen, uh, he had this thing that he was promoting called the Ownership Society. I don't think it originated with him. Uh, I think it originated with the Heritage Foundation or some think tank somewhere. Um, and it was this, it was a serious idea. You can tell it's a serious idea uh, because it has a Wikipedia page. Um, that means it's for real. And uh, what this idea was, was that what the government should do is promote ownership. That is uh, specifically home ownership, right? But not just that, like the whole idea of uh, people being invested in their communities and the companies they work in. So like part of the ownership society idea is um, uh, employees having ownership in the companies they work in, stock ownership, pension plans having ownership. Um, you know, to the, to the extent that this was not just a uh, campaign rhetoric but was an actual serious attempt at a political philosophy, he meant it. Um, and he promoted, uh, again, until everything went haywire and it became all about anti-terrorism, um, he was trying to enact policies. This is, this is what the whole, if you remember the privatized social security thing, this was part of like give people control of their own assets and they will take better care of them. Um, so it was a, uh, um, a serious conversation that, that got interrupted and I'd like to resume it tonight. I'm gonna hold on a sec. With some other thoughts on what ownership society means uh, in an age when many things are not physical but are bits. Uh, so here's his summary. Um, the more ownership there is in America, the more vitality there is, the more people have a vital stake in the future of this country. This got an answer. George Bush called this the ownership society, but what he really meant was the you're on your own society. Um, but we'll let them have that debate. Um, they have the free time to do it now. Um, let's talk about ownership. So back in the day when we all made our living like this or like this, um, it was very clear what ownership meant. Ownership meant you are the person who decides how a certain asset is used or where it is put, the allocation of resources. And politics is disputes about who owns what and how those resources will be allocated. So if we didn't have ownership, then every time someone wanted to ride a bicycle, the entire world would have to consider the proposal and hold a vote or something like that, right? That would be silly. The, the overhead of doing that is far, far greater than, than whatever you were gonna do in the bicycle ride. Uh, and you can think, in a sense, you can think of ownership as an optimization to reduce the amount of time spent on disputes, arguments, uh, voting, and other decision-making processes. And we just say, like, that object is tied to that person, and that person is a dictator over what that object does. And to the extent that they're not placing it in someone else's house or something, they, they can do that because they are, quote, the owner. Um, things started to change uh, about 400 years ago when uh, a thing that we all had that, that was not really easy to own, which was language and thought, uh, started to have a direct representation in reproducible physical media. Um, so first, uh, first it was just writing, and that, the ownership didn't get too much more complicated then, uh, because copying out books was really hard. This, this uh, fellow is working at making a copy of a manuscript, and that takes a, you know, a good, a good monk will take a, a few days to copy a good sized book, right? That's, that's not exactly a printing press. But once you start to automate it, then there's this question of, is the text something that, some, the text itself, not just the physical book, is that something that someone owns? How are we gonna think about that? Uh, my, I'm not gonna go into this history here, but modern copyright is, is in some ways a reaction to that, that dilemma for ownership. Um, it's, it turns out it's as much about subsidizing producers to own and run printing presses to invest in distribution as it is about paying authors. Um, but so it's historically an interesting thing and it's not just about ownership. Um, now it's one of those places in this, I tried to have a visual representation of what it looks like when you don't need printing presses anymore and bits just flow around the ether and they can be replicated at zero marginal cost. Um, the word marginal there is important. Uh, zero cost is if it doesn't cost you anything to write the book. Zero marginal cost is having written the book, it doesn't cost you anything or, or just about nothing to make a second copy of the book. The internet is, is paradise for zero marginal cost transactions, right? 
Um, uh, so this is some code I wrote many years ago. Look, now I have three copies. <laughs> Just one button, right? Like, it's so easy. Believe it or not, there are still a lot of uh, public policies and companies that don't understand this. Um, and <laughs> but many of them, increasingly, especially among technology companies, many of them are beginning to understand it. And I want to explain the, how this looks from the company's point of view first, uh, then explain how it looks from an employee's point of view and why it is important that you be involved in open source software, even if it's not your full-time job. It should be part of your job if you're going to work in technology. So the first thing you have to understand is the, the incredible bargaining chip you hold in your hand, or rather in your head, by being a skilled programmer or someone who works with technology, can do documentation writing, can be involved in open source style collaboration. From a business's point of view, why do, why do they do open source? Well, for one thing, it helps with recruiting and onboarding people. Someone comes in, they already know how to use Git, you know, they're, they're accustomed to a certain style of development, um, and also you found them, like you were, your employees were out there in an open source project, uh, they met this person, you've already seen their resume in a, in a sense because you've worked with them directly. Um, a lot of people get hired through their work in open source. Um, and if you're just looking for a nakedly utilitarian justification to do open source work, um, that's a good one right there. People will notice you, you'll have a stronger resume, and some of them will be hiring someday. One second. Um, I won't go too much into the engineering practices. This is not an engineering talk, um, but a lot of what my company talks to clients about, or our company, Cecilia's back there. Hi, Cecilia. Um, is, is making their internal engineering practices look more the way open source projects are run. Um, another thing is, if your programmers are involved in a lot of open source projects, uh, that means that they're out there in the trenches working directly with program programmers at your customers and your competitors, companies. And you get this tremendous insight into where people are actually spending their time, what their priorities are. You can see where your competitor is allocating their best coders, right? Because, was that something I said? <laughs> I, it's kind of nice this way, okay. Thanks. Um, you, all of a sudden, it's like your company grew tentacles that have thousands of nerve endings and suckers on them. Like you are out there sensing all the things that are happening. The surface area of your company just increased dramatically because your programmers are working directly with the programmers in, in other organizations. And you can, as long as your managers know to talk to them and filter that information back up, that actually becomes a tremendous source of competitive uh, insight uh, and also market insight. Um, also, uh, chances are whatever tech you wrote uh, is something that someone else could have written and probably did. So suppose you wrote uh, uh, a, uh, an online service that does X. I don't even care what, X, what feature X is. If you're the only person in the world who can sell X, that's great. You're probably going to make a lot of money. But as soon as someone wants to challenge you in that marketplace, the easiest way for them to do it is to build something that's open source or take something that is already open source and 80% of the way there, add a few features to it and call it, you know, not X because that would be a trademark infringement, but you know, thing that is a lot like X but has our own name on it. And okay, maybe it's not feature for feature uh, equivalent to X, but it pretty much does the same thing. All of a sudden, you are now competing with the entire open source community that contributes to that thing. And if that company's smart, they will have brought in partners. There's no way, no matter how big you are, that you can compete with that. Um, so what's happening increasingly, and we'll look at this a little bit more uh, in a few slides down, is that companies build just about everything they build out of open source, and then the last little bit, the thing they want to distinguish themselves with, they will keep closed source. Uh, we don't, personally, we only do open source, and I hope you will too. But if you can't have that, if you don't have that option, try to at least arrange it so that most of what you build is open source, because that little bit of proprietary stuff on the edge, someone's going to come along and commoditize it very soon, and then your best bet at that moment, your best move, is to open source that as well and c concentrate on something else. Um, it is also a great reality check uh, on a company's internal beliefs about what the market wants um, and technology decisions. If you, if you suddenly find that, you know, your engineers are advocating, like, let's go all, you know, let's do everything no SQL, relational databases are dead. Um, for certain kinds of problems. And then you go out there and you notice that all the open source projects working on those kinds of problems are doing it in Postgres just fine. Then 
you can at least at the design meeting, you can say, well, justify that. Like, I see that they're not, and they're not, and they're not doing it. Why do you think we should do it? You really, you get the insight into sort of the, the best practices of a lot of organizations um, by doing open source. Uh, it's also a great way to create uh, a, different, uh, a different shape to a market. Uh, one of the things we see most often is that a company will release open source software, not because they're going to sell services directly on it, not because uh, they have a, uh, a particularly strong customer demand, but they do it to disrupt an existing marketplace so that they can come in and do something else. In fact, my, one of my um, long ago and still one of the longest jobs I've held, which was uh, uh, working on the Subversion version control system, which is a thing that we had before Git. Oh well, <laughs> lost that one. But, um, uh, but Subversion was essentially started to disrupt a market. It wasn't, the company that made it was not really selling Subversion. What they wanted was to sell another service and they needed to have a commodity uh, baseline open source revision control system out there in order to get people to want the other thing they were selling. Um, and finally, your programmers, uh, I'm speaking to you as though you are an employer, which some of you are, your programmers are happier when they do open source. Uh, they have a, an external audience um, they, they are validated every day. They, when they review a patch, their expertise is validated. When they submit a patch and it gets reviewed, their contribution is validated. Um, it just feels good. Um, in general, I, I've never done this survey. Uh, if someone wants to fund us to do the survey, we'd be happy to. But uh, I suspect that if you went out and you interviewed programmers just on a scale of who's, who's happy in their job and who's not, and then you took those answers and you looked at amount of open source participation, there would be a direct correlation, and I think it would be a, a causative correlation as well. Um, okay, so that's for businesses. Um, so the thing I was trying, this, is, this really should be the flower slide, this is very hard to represent visually. The way to think about software these days is that to a first approximation, it's actually kind of all open source. Um, even, the, even the bleeding edge stuff, like the TensorFlow and the, you know, all those deep learning neural network, uh, libraries and things that are doing complicated scheduling so that your Lyft uh, ride arrives, you know, one minute sooner or something. Most of the software that's doing that is open source. Maybe some of the data sets aren't, maybe some of the algorithms uh, that are being coded into the rule engines are not, but most of that code is open source and all the innovation is happening just, so open source is this constantly expanding sphere of software and all the innovation that's happening is happening on the surface of the sphere. And as the sphere expands, it will, it will come to surround, to encapsulate what used to be its old surface when the balloon was smaller. And that stuff on the inside, now it's open source. And now there's some new innovation going on on the surface. But eventually, it's all going to be open source. And uh, if you know how to, to swim in that ocean, you will have a lot of things you can do. So we'll, we'll get to the, to the advocacy part in a bit. Um, but even if you're not able to work entirely on open source, it would be, I think, a very foolish move to work at a tech company and have no involvement in open source. You're basically cutting yourself off from everything but the surface of this sphere, and that surface is not even staying constant. It's, it's expanding, and it'll go beyond you, and you'll have expertise in some proprietary, te proprietary technology that nobody wants to use anymore because it's been commoditized, and now everyone's using the open source thing. Um, talk to older programmers, and they will describe that happening over and over. Don't let it happen to you. Um, that's me trying to show the filled interior of a sphere on a two-dimensional slide. Should have been the flower. Let's look at something pretty instead while I take a drink of water. Okay. So in your career, um, I'm going to advocate both on practical grounds uh, and, and sort of on political, even moral grounds, that you should be involved in open source. Um, I've made some of the argument already. How do you make sure that that happens? Let's assume you're already sold, as I know you all are, but you want to make sure it happens. Uh, check out your employee agreements um, before you go to a job. Make sure that there are no clauses in there that say uh, that you can't work on projects that you worked on while you were at the employer. Like if you, your resume has to be able to travel with you in open source. If you sign an agreement that says, okay, and none of the expertise that I've acquired here are my you know, my uh, ability to contribute to this project that, that this employer uh, paid, partly funded me to become an expert in and be able to become a contributor to the upstream and even a maintainer of, if I'm not allowed to continue being a maintainer or contributor after I leave the company for a period of five years, then they still own the resume. Now it's not, it doesn't matter that I have that expertise, I'm blocked from using it. Watch out for any kind of anti-competitive or anti-open source participation stuff. Um, 
there, those are rare, but also employers are getting stricter about anti-competitive clauses. Uh, and uh, I sort of expect that trend to go up before it goes down. Um, is there an organizational policy? For example, do you have to ask permission before contributing to an open source project at your employer? Or can you just do it and your employer will not claim any proprietary rights over the code that you contributed upstream because you know, you know that, that the employer is using that code and that having a healthy upstream is, is good. The section that every employer in the universe calls the intellectual property section in the employee contract often contains clauses that are very unfriendly toward open source participation. It says like, you are obligated to help the company um, uh, uh, get a patent on something that you did while on company time or even just while employed there. Well, you may be working in an open source project where you sent in a patch and you did something, you implemented something that it turns out the company later wants, I mean, you, you're obviously a public service department, you wouldn't do this, but private sector companies will. Um, they want to get a patent. This actually happened to my team once. They are looking at possibly getting a patent on it later, and now you've made two different promises, one to your employer and a contradictory one to your open source project where you're supposed to be contributing things that you're not going to then threaten them with patent help, you know, with patent litigation about. So watch out for the IP clauses. Um, and, and also try to convince your employer not to call them IP clauses, because that's a bad word. Um, so that's just one aspect of organizational policy. I'm not going to dive into all the, all the things, um, but some of the things to look at are a policy on whether you are allowed to make upstream contributions. But in addition to that, uh, in general, do you see employees at this company, other people who've already been there for a while, do you see them making upstream contributions? Um, and watch out, they may be doing so under their own name, like your GitHub profile is associated with you. Uh, and that's important that your reputation travel with you. It should be associated with you. But it means that there's no, not necessarily a visible, um, an obvious association between the contributor and the employer who may have paid for the time they spent making that contribution. Um, so you want to ask around, if you're talking to engineering managers or other employees there, ask them like, hey, how is it contributing to upstreams? What projects do you folks work on? Uh, who here has contributed? Can I talk to them? What was the experience like? Um, the more liberal a company's uh, upstream contribution policy is, and also the more liberally they actually do it, the more sheer number of hours per employee they spend doing that. Uh, First of all, I think the better place it's going to be to work, and also I think the more successful a company, all other things being equal, it's going to be. A company that is unafraid to let its employees contribute stuff upstream, upstream is a company that understands its, what its valuable assets are, um, its monopolizable assets, I should say, and, and where, where its assets that are most valuable when most free are. And that's a, a very healthy way for a company to think. So ask them about that. Um, ask them. Can you go to conferences, give presentations? How can you get physically in a room with other people doing open source in the same areas you're doing it? Um, it's, it's very good when a company encourages its, its employees to do that. And also, it's a good recruiting tactic. Then you can scout around, and you can bring people back into the company. Um, uh, a great question is, has the company actually launched their own open source projects? Uh, and if they did, uh, are those still maintained? How are they doing? Did they do it right? That is to say, did they launch it uh, from in the open from the beginning or did they kind of like write the whole thing in-house and then like release it at the end which usually means there's some problem there are proprietary dependencies or, or you know the documentation is crap or something like that um, but if they are launching their own projects find out which ones go take a look at those projects and see what you think of them that'll give you a lot of insight into the engineering culture um, so uh, and also do they let other people uh, who are not at the company contribute to those projects do they make a social distinction between their own employees and others, or do they treat it like a real open source project? So those are all things to look at. Um, so why would you want to do this? Uh, well, think about that while I take this drink of water. Thank you. I didn't need the water, I just wanted to give you a chance to think. So I'm going to uh, posit that there are several good things here. One of them is just good for you. It's good for your career. Um, you will have more opportunities. You will meet and associate with more programmers. You will thus be exposed to more technologies. You will also become much more quickly aware when the skills and the knowledge that you have are getting out of date. That's certainly one thing that open source has brought me is I, I like right away 
began to sense when my, my old web 1.0 way of making websites was no longer the way it should be done, when I noticed like all the cool kids around me in the open source projects were using other tools and, and like even things like JavaScript. Wow, we have JavaScript now. Okay, I guess, guess we've got to start doing that. Right, like you, you can't get left behind. Well, you can get left behind if you don't bother to learn anything, but you can't get left behind unawares. You can't get caught by surprise when you're working at open source. So it's good for you. Um, but let me make a bigger ask or a bigger proposal that increasingly uh, everything that's happening that, that matters, uh, at least here in, the, in our sort of first world problems universe that we live in, is being decided by software. I don't just mean AI, like, you know, the, the robots are taking over, although that's happening. Um, I just mean that we're surrounded by algorithms. Um, algorithms are, are deciding, uh, you know, who, which, which products you're going to be offered. They're, they're deciding how your, your x-rays get read. Um, the, the entire world is pervaded by software. And if it is the case that the interior of that software is mostly open source, which it mostly is, then the more open source people are doing, the more people are walking around understanding what is going on around all of us. And the more people are equipped to look at uh, some, some system, whether it's the software running in a car, or the software that decides whether people get parole or not, or whatever it is, the more they're going to look at that going to look at that and view it as a system that can be hacked. Uh, and I don't mean hacked in a pejorative sense there, I mean as a system that can be understood and deliberately changed uh, in order to serve its either its intended purpose better or to serve a new purpose. Um, the, the, the alternative to that is you are working on a bunch of technology and a bunch of, of systems that someone else has chosen for you and when you acquire expertise in it, you are not able to take that expertise uh, for the most part with you when you go to another job and therefore you're not able to, uh, for the most part, take it out into the wider world and use it to understand and affect the systems around you. Open source is a way of not having to ask permission to understand and to change systems. I mean, you still, you know, you might be breaking a license if you hack on your car, I guess, and you might uh, not all of a car that runs software is running open source software, but increasingly parts of a car are. Increasingly parts of your radio are. There's software-defined radio. Um, you know, the, the fact that web browsers and web servers were both hackable things has been tremendously important to the web, but it also means that when you're surfing around and you, you see what looks like a, a phishing attack or you see cookies being used in a funny way, even if you yourself are not an expert, there's expertise all around you because all of that stuff is implemented, widely implemented in open source software and people understand these systems. So doing open source is a form of staying politically engaged in the structures that are actually affecting our lives. I'm not saying it's a substitute for politics itself. Um, and also it feels weird to be standing at any location where Tony Preckwinkle has spoken. Um, that's <laughs> humbling. But um, the, so let's go back to the ownership society. What I'm really trying to say is when you're writing open source software, and especially when you are paid to do it, which is very common by the way, you are, you've entered a new zone that the concept of ownership was not really designed uh, to address and we just need new words or we need to redefine what the word ownership means if you um, uh, So let me give you a, a bit of background that many of you may not be aware of there are many many salaried developers doing open source and in fact a lot of the open source that you use certainly the Linux kernel like virtually all of it um, but, but also things like the software that runs Wikipedia, um, a lot of the software in ma the Macintosh operating system, all these things. These are written by salaried developers. They are paid market rates to write open source software. Um, and furthermore, these people move from company to company working on the same projects. Like, th that's weird if you think from a traditional, like, feudal perspective, right? You, you're working on whatever it is, the Linux kernel, some other thing. I worked on Subversion at one company and worked on it in a different company. Um, you keep the same colleagues, you go to work, you work on the same code, your, your GitHub identity or, or whatever the, the hosting site where the repository is, is, is the same identity. It's just someone else is signing your paychecks. And maybe you're addressing different priorities in the code now. Maybe that company needs slightly different things. But you're like, 
it's not really clear who's working for whom here. Yeah, you, you have a, a, a paycheck and a salary, but um, the company hired you in many cases because you have expertise in that project. And they understood that what they were getting is not just your technical ability, they're getting the web of relationships and your, the social knowledge that you have about how to navigate in that project. And they know that if you leave, you will take that with you. The reputation accrues to you, the social know-how, the, the ties, everything, that's you, that's not the company. Um, so I, a really interesting question to ask yourself when you are doing paid open source development is, are you capital or are you labor? Someone wants to know. The answer, <laughs> the answer is not clear, right? They, like, it really breaks down that distinction. And I think that um, we are entering a time when it would be very nice to have a lot of people employed specifically in software where it is not clear that they are labor and that the, by the nature of the work they are doing uh, and by, by the, the kinds of relationships they're forming with each other and with the projects that are independent of the companies they work for, that they are just as much capital as they are labor. Um, I think that's going to be a good thing in general and I hope that all of you will find a way in your jobs to be part of it. There's not, um, what was that? That's what I was looking for. I don't know what the flower was there for. Um, there are, this is fossjobs.net, like there are sites that post full-time open source jobs all the time. I'm not expecting everyone here to get a job working as a technologist doing full-time open source. Please go for it, like I hope you will. But what I'm really saying is when you take a job, um, make sure that you are, that the company is friendly to open source, or the organization, it may not be a company, uh, that you will have the ability to bring open source in-house and use it, including copyleft licensed code. Um, and uh, you know, outside this talk, I can explain to you why copyleft is nothing to be afraid of. Some employers are afraid of it. They shouldn't be. Um, uh, to take it in, to use it, to fix bugs, to send those bugs upstream, and in general, to participate in the wider world, wider world of software development that is not controlled or tied to your company. That will be good for the company. You are not, you're not betraying them, you're not doing them any harm, you're helping them, but it's also good for you and it's also good for the, the system of, of sort of software-defined life that is uh, tragically developing around us. The only way to keep it civilized uh, is if most of it is open source and there are a lot of people out there who know how to hack it. Um, that's it, I will stop there. There's a whole other section to this talk that involves graphs, but we can talk about that another time. Um, but I would take questions, I guess. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we have time for a few questions, so uh, raise your hands if you have questions for Carl, and I'll run the mic to you. Get some seats. Hold on, I have to run the mic, it's for the video. Okay. Yeah, what was that actual URL from the last slide before you got to like the whole Monopoly part? Because I couldn't read it. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, FOSS, F-O-S-S, jobs.net. FOSS. Free and open source software. Hello, Octopus. And also, by the way, um, here are, so these slides are, these slides are under an open source license. You can get them. They're at those PowerPoint, PDF, or, or LibreOffice open document presentation format. Um, and then also there's a video of me sort of doing a preview of this talk in a hotel lobby really late at night last week at that YouTube link. <laughs> oh, hold on. Oh, sorry. Are you able to uh, tell the difference whether uh, open source uh, software company is willing to uh, hire to uh, enhance the uh, company's uh, potential or just hiring because they know a competitor, uh, they want to get uh, information on how a competitor is. Uh I, I think I missed a key word in your question. Tell them they're hiring to. Are they hiring a spy? Uh, I don't, would that be a bad thing if they were? I, in other words, it, it, you're saying if someone hires a person who has been active in an open source project and they were at one company and now another company hires them to work in the same project? Is there a sort of okay, corporate espionage aspect? In several aspect? instances, I've applied to uh, various uh, open source companies and uh, they were not forthcoming as to whether they were actually looking for somebody who knew, the, uh, who knew uh, what was uh, required versus who they uh, needed to have uh, to uh, uh, find out how their competitors are doing. Oh, that's what's shutting me out. That, okay, that, I mean, I feel like I've not heard of that happening much uh, in open source jobs. Maybe it happens sometimes. 
Um, but I feel like that's also, that's more a, a general question of hiring and corporate espionage and are you hiring this person so they can tattle on what their former employer was doing. And that doesn't have to be about an open source project. They could just hire someone to do that anyway. Like even if that person had nothing to do with open source at the first company. So I, I don't hear about that phenomenon much. Um, and I don't know the specific reasons why, why you encountered that. But that's just not, it's not a factor I've run into at the companies I work with, for what it's worth. Hi. I've been thinking a lot during your presentation, and uh, um, I don't work, I, I'm not a coder, and I am loosely associated, associated with the tech sphere. And to me, the open source model seems like such a fantastic way to work on any problem. Yes. With people sharing their information and knowledge and building systems together to make things better. So I'm wondering, have you seen in other industries and functions a kind of open source mentality developing because I can't think of any examples off the top of my head. Um, in order for open source to work, it needs certain conditions. Uh, and the main one is that the materials that are being worked with can be completely perfectly replicated at no marginal cost. And so it's like you'll never have open source agriculture. Uh, you'll never have open source manufacturing. Open source hardware is a term that gets bandied around. I think it, it is a meaningless term. It's a contradiction. The only thing that can be open source about open source hardware is the blueprints and the plans. In other words, the software. So why not just call it open source software, right? Um, I, the, so we didn't go into this in the presentation. The reason that that ingredient is crucial um, is that if you have an open license, in other words, no, no statutory monopoly, no state granted monopoly is being applied. That's what open source licenses do. They take away the state granted monopoly. And then, and then you have the actual goods themselves can be replicated at no cost. What that means is that anyone can fork. Anybody can come along and say, hey, I see you've got this project here. I don't like how your group is running it. I'm going to take the entire project, make a copy over here, and get a bunch of people, and we're going to run it our own way. And we'll just, those copies will diverge, or maybe they'll converge later. But the threat of those forks happening is what makes open source governance possible. It's what gets everyone to come into consensus, because they all know that if they don't come to agreement, it'll just splinter out into a bunch of forks. And so curiously, the ability to go off and do your own thing with it is what makes everyone work together. Um, if you have a situation where the goods are replicable at zero marginal cost and there's no statutory monopoly, uh, as with like strict copyright and things like that, then you can have open source dynamics. Without those ingredients, I think you cannot have it. And so that's why we don't see it. Um, so, uh, you know, Wikipedia is sort of an example of that, right? It's not, I mean, it's running on software, but the content is not software, but it is a successful example. And in fact, it is true that you can copy all of Wikipedia for, you know, just the cost of the servers, right? The, the storage space. Um, and, and organizations do. There are people all the time take stuff from the English Wikipedia, they copy it into the whatever language Wikipedia, and they translate it, um, and vice versa. So you do see it in some places, but most of human endeavor, which deals with physical stuff, can never do it. Did, did, was there a follow-up thing you wanted to say? Should I just gone for it? Um, I th it feels also like there's a certain kind of mindset that goes along with the open source community. Do you think that there are places where there is a false sense of barrier to forking something? where it's not so much the actual thing that's preventing people from open sourcing it, but rather the mindset that it can't be done? Uh, do you, when you say uh, preventing people from open sourcing, you mean preventing them from forking? Yeah. Um, I mean, n mostly when I see people being reluctant to fork, it's for good reasons. Like forking takes effort. You've got to go, you do have social lobbying to do to get people to join your fork, and probably they won't, usually. Most forks fail. Um, Occasionally, there are some famous examples where they succeed. Um, no, I, well, so, so this is, I'm too much in the open source world. Like, the people I'm generally working with are very comfortable with the idea of forking, and they, they just evaluate on, is this worth the effort basis? But yeah, I think when you, when you see people doing this for the first time, there are cases where, actually, this is what happens with our clients a lot. Um, they are not clear on the idea that 
they could fork something someone else is doing, that someone could fork their thing, and they're confused about whether, um, like, wait, you mean somebody could fork our code and change our software? And we're like, ah, they can only change their own copy. Don't worry, they can't change your copy. And once you start thinking about, don't worry, you always control your own copies. The question is just whether someone can make their own copy of that and do things to their copy. That's what usually clears up that misunderstanding. So yeah, I think that mindset does happen sometimes, but it also doesn't last long. Once people get the idea, then they're like, oh, okay, now we get how it works. Uh, last question. Last question, I think. What advice would you have to someone who's nervous about contributing to an open source project? You know, either worry about submitting a pull request or fixing an issue, or someone who's a young or less experienced engineer who maybe doesn't have the confidence to do it. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, uh, I'm glad you asked that. This is one of those. Uh, this is like one of those like white privilege shows its and male privilege shows its ugly face. I was a new, brash, and very inexperienced programmer when I started contributing to open source. I was incompetent, and I felt no compunctions about contributing, right? <laughs> I was like, surely, surely Richard Stallman will want my patch to Emacs, right? <laughs> and uh, it took me a long time to understand that not everyone is such an idiot, and they have good reasons to be nervous. Um, so what I would say is, uh, first of all, you're probably not I'm, not, I'm saying you, I don't actually know if you're, you know, are you asking for a friend or asking for yourself, right? But um, you're probably not as, as, as uh, inexperienced or, or slovenly about your code as you think, don't worry. Two, uh, you, the nice thing about open source projects is you can see the tone of the project because all the mailing lists and the GitHub issue, you know, threads, all those conversations are archived and in public view. So you can look and see at how other people's pull requests have been received. And so what you could do is you could actually go find someone who's only made one pull request and who looks like they were kind of a newcomer and see how the project received it. And if they got treated well, you will be treated well too. Um, and then projects have reputations. Like some, the Linux kernel is, is famously nasty to new contributors, or at least Linus himself has sometimes been. Um, don't, you know, don't start out contributing a package to the kernel. Start with a really friendly project, but most projects are friendly. So expect to be well received. Do expect feedback, expect to have to iterate your pull request several times. That is a compliment. When they review your code and they say, uh, thank you, but you know, our coding standards say do this here and that there, and also you've got a, you know, an order and squared algorithm here and you can do it in constant time if you just change the loop in this way, whatever it is, that's, they're paying you the highest compliment when they pay you attention. That's why we have the expression pay attention, like pay money. They are, they're giving you their time and their brains and that's, Never take that kind of technical criticism as anything other than encouragement. That's all it is. Um, does that answer the question? All right. All right. Great note to end Thanks. on. Thank you, Carl. Yeah.